Welcome to a very special pastry edition of ACF Chefs Forum. Now, more than ever, it's important for culinarians to connect, to share, and to offer inspiration and mentorship, which is exactly why we're excited to have an expert here with information just for you, the leaders and future leaders of the food service industry. I'm Jackie Pressinger, American Culinary Federation's Director of Strategic Partnerships, and on behalf of our partners at Massachusetts and New Hampshire ProStart, I'm delighted to welcome you to today's exciting presentation on how to shoe live from my alma mater, the Culinary Institute of America in Hyde Park, New York. Valentine's Day can be big business for bakeries, pastry shops, hotels, restaurants, and caterers. So today we'll hope that you'll be inspired to take your dessert skills to the next level. You're all in for a special treat with today's demonstration. So Jen, are you excited? I am absolutely excited. Um, we are absolutely excited and on behalf of the Massachusetts Pro Start, uh, I'd also like to welcome all of our culinary students tuning in today from across the country. I'm Jennifer Almeida, I'm the Director of Education for the Massachusetts Restaurant Association Education Foundation. And I wanted to let you know exactly how excited we are to have you here today to enhance your pastry skills. We want to hear from you. So today we'll be taking your questions for our featured chef live during this webinar, and chef is excited to hear from you. Please be sure to use the chat function to collaborate with the other chef and students tuning in and the Q&A function to post questions to today's featured guest speaker. Okay, let's get the discussion started in that chat. Please let us know where you are tuning in from today. And now I'm going to pass the mic to Amy to let us know more about our special guest chef. Hello, everyone. My name is Amy Pariso. I'm the executive director of the New Hampshire Lodging and Restaurant Association Education Foundation. We are so pleased to welcome today's feature culinarian who is here today to inspire you, as he is not only a great chef, but a true artist. In fact, we had to shorten his bio since he has achieved so much during his career so far. Today's guest, Chef Jesse Jackson III, CMB, lecturing instructor of baking and pastry arts, began his culinary career just like many of you at the age of 16 when he enrolled in a two-year culinary arts vocational program as part of his high school education. Upon graduating with high school honors, um, Jeff, Jeff Jesse went on to study baking and pastry arts at Johnson & Wales University in Providence, Rhode Island. While a student there, he was an award-winning student competitor and completed an internship at the Walt Disney World Resort Hollywood Studios in Orlando, Florida. Upon graduating JWU in 2010, Jesse moved to Boston, Massachusetts and was part of the opening team for Isabel's Curly Cakes, a cupcake bakery, part of the Todd English Enterprise Restaurant Group. He then decided to further his education and enrolled at the Culinary Institute of America in Hyde Park, New York, earning another degree in baking and pastry arts. Shortly after his CIA externship at the Waldorf Astoria at the Boca Raton Resort in Florida, Jesse graduated with honors and moved back to Boston, working at a number of top restaurants, including at Eastern Standard Kitchen and Drinks, Troquet Restaurant, and as executive pastry chef at Number Nine, one of Boston's and the country's most esteemed restaurants. In mid, to, in mid 2020, Chef Jesse made a career shift in the culinary education field and accepted an offer to become a baking and pastry, uh, excuse me, baking and pastry chef instructor at the Culinary Institute of America and earned his certified master baking designation in 2022. Whew, that's a lot. <laughs> Chef, thanks so much for joining us today. At this time, we'll pass the presentation over to you. Thank you very much, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I appreciate everyone. Uh, welcome to the Culinary Institute of America. Again, my name is Chef Jesse Jackson III, and today we're going to be talking about that issue. Uh, Valentine's Day is coming up, very, very special holiday, and this is just a reminder for all you men out there, Valentine's Day is next week. Do not forget. You always forget, right? So this is a reminder for you. Don't forget. Uh, I, have a, I have a friend that uh, has a chocolate boutique in Buffalo, and she tells me every single year, the busiest day of the year is February 13th. All the men come in because they forgot to get their wives or their girlfriends or significant others something for Valentine's Day. So today I'm going to show you... Uh, Techniques to broaden your range about the pan choux. So pan choux is a staple in the pastry kitchen. It's something that 
uh, is a technical attribute that every great pastry chef needs to know how to, how to work with. And also something that you need to know how to uh, utilize the dough because we use for many, many different things. So today we're making uh, shoe or crack line. The crack line is the, uh, the, the sugary crust on the outside. So pate is, we, we here at the Culinary Institute of America, we call it, uh, it is part of the pre-cooked method. The pre-cooked method is called the pre-cooked method because we are actually pre-cooking the flour before it goes into the oven. We do that process because we want to rely on a attribute called starch-free gelatinization. Starches gelatinize when they're heated. Starches, when they absorb water, they absorb water, they swell up, and then they begin to burst and then gelatinize to create a structure. That happens automatically when we put our products into the oven. So no matter what, if you're baking that one that has flour and starch in it, it's going to gelatinize, period, when you put it into the oven. But with starch pre-gelatinization, we're going to pre-cook the starches ahead of time before they go into the oven. We want to rely on that reaction for a couple of reasons. Number one, Starch pre-gelatinization can retain more moisture. Starches that are pre-gelatinized will literally retain more moisture. The more moisture that we retain, the more steam that's created. The leavening we have in our pate choux is from chemical, uh, physical leavening, my apologies. Physical leavening from the steam that's being introduced from the moisture inside. So we have that extra amount of steam in there. The more steam we have, the more puff we're going to get, the more volume we're going to get as well. So we create that nice big pocket on the inside that we want and we uh, desire when we're creating any type of shoe product. Secondly, we need to worry about the moisture as well too. In the beginning, we're adding, we have moisture from our liquids. We, uh, today I'm going to be using milk and water, right? But you can use other types of liquid as well to get a similar product, right? But we're adding moisture, but we're also adding moisture from our liquids in the beginning. We're also adding moisture from our eggs at the very end. If we have too much moisture in our product, the shoe will not puff up. It will actually collapse. Moisture in the oven, in terms of baking, right, is very, very heavy. And especially a shoe that has a very, very thin crust, if there's too much weight inside caused from the moisture, it's going to cause the product to sink, and you won't have any rise, and you won't have a hollow center. So we need to make sure we do all of those things properly. Pat a shoe has a ratio. Ratio is an equal, is an equal amount of ingredients in relation to each other. Right, the ratio for pate choux is two one one two. That is in relation to two parts liquid, one part fat, one part flour, and one and two parts eggs. So each of those uh, ingredients have a specific function in our shoe, and I will explain them explain their function as we start to go along. But the important thing here is about ratios. Ratios in the pastry kitchen, at least, are written in the order that they're going to be utilized. We utilize the liquids first then our fat, then the next step will be utilizing the flour, and then at the very end, we're gonna add the eggs in. So in case you forget or you're unsure of, right, your Food Network Challenge or whatever, right, you need to work, figure out, I, I forgot my formula for my shoe, just remember the ratio, the ratio is then gonna be in the order that you make it. So let's get started. So first thing I'm gonna do is grab my ingredients here, already scaled out. So first, we're using our two liquids here, milk and water. I could make this with all water. I could make this with all milk. I'm using a 50-50 blend of milk and water. The milk will give me a little bit more color on my shoe, a little bit thicker crust. We're also relying on the lactose, the sugar and milk lactose, and also the casein and whey protein that will give us a darker color as well too. So I have uh, eight ounces of each, eight ounces of water, eight ounces of milk in there. And then I'm gonna add my fat in here too eight ounces of cubed up butter. We can use other different types of fat, right? It doesn't necessarily need to be solid. It can be liquid as well. We can use oil, shortening, or some formulas that made with shortening as well. But the idea of the object here is to make sure that the fat is cubed up and as small as possible uh, before we, when we start cooking. If they're all the same size, they're going to heat evenly and they're also going to melt it as evenly as well as well too. So we wanna make sure that they're even size, we'll have even cooking as well. Then we're going to add about four grams. This is four grams of salt in there. The salt will aid in the color, but also the flavor as well, too. So I have my liquids and my fat in there. I'm going to put it onto my stove. Heat it up. There we go. So with our fat, we want to make sure that whatever, regardless of what fat that you're doing, using, you want to make sure that the fat is melted and liquefied before this comes to a boil. We need to bring our liquids to a boil to begin the starch gelatinization 
when we add the flour in. When I say a boil, right, a boil can be translated to many different things, meaning the entire thing is beginning to bubble up. Now, because we have milk in here, milk, as perhaps you've known, right, if you put in a milk in a container and in, in a pot, right, you bring it to a boil, right, the milk will begin to bubble over, right? So we want to make sure everything is bubble, everything is consistently bubbling and a rolling boil. That's what I mean when I say a boil, not just around the outside. So we want to make sure that our fat is melted before we move on to our next step, which would be adding our flour. And that reason is because if our fat is not melted all the way, if we add the flour and the flour and the butter, well, we'll start to create a roux, but also we'll have chunks of butter in there too. Those butter chunks are going to melt at another point. At which point would that be? It'll probably be when it's in the oven. We'll have, really, the shoe will be sitting in a pool of fat. We don't want that. We want all of the fat to be mixed in with all of our products together. We want to make sure, so I always have this on medium, medium low heat. I stir a little bit with my wooden spoon just to begin the process of circulating the heat evenly throughout so my fat can melt out. And obviously the smaller you cut your fat, the faster this process will go. But we want to rely on the temperature, the residual heat in our pot to keep our shoe and everything, our base here, going up. Now I want to bring this to a boil. As soon as I bring it to a boil, I want to shut it off. I want to shut it off right away because as we're beginning to boil, we're beginning, well, the milk is going to boil, boil up. But what else is happening is we're going to be again losing moisture. I want, I want to release the moisture. I want to release that moisture because I want to get rid of it in the beginning. I'm going to add more in when I add my eggs, right? But I want to remain in control. You're making this, you're the boss, you're in control. I tell it to my students all the time. Don't let your products defeat you. If something is wrong, right, something was wrong, right, you have the power to change that. So right now my heat is on medium, right? If I had this on high, my milk would begin to boil before my fat was melted. So I want to remain in as much control as possible. Perfectly fine to turn the heat down, or turn the heat off, right? If you need to do something else, change that, right? But we want to make sure that we don't lose too much moisture at the beginning, because that's going to throw off our ratio in the very, in the very beginning. We don't want to start less than where we're getting from. Now that my fat is fully melted, I'm gonna crank my heat all the way up, bring it to a boil. Everything is nice and homogenous here. And if anyone's wondering, I'm using cold milk here. Cold milk, could you use a different type of milk? Yeah, half and half, two percent. Yes, of course, right? It's obviously going to affect the color and the texture of your product, but the whole milk would be uh, ideal here. And of course, you could, if you have a dairy allergy, you could use uh, all water, and then you can use shortening instead of butter. <laughs> Drink this up. I have my flour here, eight ounces of bread flour. If you're using bread flour here, it has a higher protein content, higher protein content, lower starch content. It's gonna give us the structure for our shoe. I can use different types of flours. I've only made this with bread flour and all-purpose flour. And if you use all-purpose flour, you have a, a little bit thinner crust. It's going to depend on what it is that you're making it with, what it is your final product that you're making with your, for your shoe, right? I prefer to use bread flour. It gets a little bit more structure there. All right, so we're coming right to a boil here. I'm going to shut off my heat. Take my flour and dump it all in all at once, straight in. Keep the heat off and stir. I want to combine everything here. I want to hype right now. I'm hydrating the flour. I want the flour to absorb all, the little, all of the liquid inside. But also, I, the reason I turn the heat off as well, because again, I want to remain in con as much control as possible. If I have my heat on, the flour that's being mixed in on the bottom is going to begin to gelatinize, while the flour on top that hasn't mixed in yet is still being mixed in. So I'll have uneven cooking. I want to remain in control. I want this, I'm going to tell this when I'm ready for it to begin the next process, which would be gelatinizing the flour. So I want to remain as much control as possible here. I'm going to keep combining here as much as possible. Keep stirring in until it comes together. And when I know I'm ready, that's when I'll turn my heat back on. Just like that. Turn back on. Now, when we're pre-gelatinizing our starches here, right, we want to work on as high a heat as possible. Now, we're, if you're working on gas heat here, obviously the flame starts to come out the side of the pot. 
right? If it's burning your fingers, obviously turn it down. Don't, uh, don't burn your fingers off. You need those, right? But of course, we want it to work as, as hot as possible. If the heat is not hot enough, the fat inside will begin to melt down and you'll just be sitting in a pool of fat and the fat will begin to just fry our dough inside. We don't want that, right? So we want to work on as high heat as possible. Wooden spoon would be ideal. I've broken a few rubber spatulas. Not that I'm too strong. It's just not as sturdy as the wooden spoon. Well, what we want to create here is the fond on the bottom. Just like in cooking, savory in the savory kitchen, we like the fond. It's called fond because we're very fond of it. Creating that fond on the bottom, that's telling me that I'm cooking the starches as well. What I'm also looking for here is a lot of steam to be coming out. That steam is all that excess moisture that I'm escaping, ev evaporating here. So I don't have excess moisture at the very end. Keep going. I want to create that nice, thin, uh, thick fond on the bottom, right? It should be nice and blonde. This is one of those things where uh, it will be a good idea to go to the gym, right? Your arm, I tell my students all the time, all right, mix it until your arm falls off and then use your other arm. So we're gonna keep going here. Keep going, keep going. So we see that nice fond on the bottom. It just begins to start to turn tan, starts to get a, a tinge of color. That's how we know that we are ready to move on, right? We wanna constantly keep working and mixing and smoothing it around so it does not burn. It's very easy to burn. You have to remain in control as much as possible. So I'm done here. Transfer this to my KitchenAid bowl here. It should flop in just like that. And the bottom of your pot should look exactly like that. Just like that, nice and even. That's what our fond should be. So if you're cooking your shoe, you're unsure if I'm ready yet, if I, if I cooked it long enough, look at the bottom of your pot. It should look, it should be nice and thin, it should be evenly, evenly colored but evenly spread out throughout the bottom of my box. All right, put this down here. Over to our mixer now. I'm gonna turn the mixer off. Like I said earlier, right, we wanna release all the excess moisture in the beginning, so we can add it back in in the end with our eggs. So here we can see a lot of steam coming out of my bowl. That's all the excess moisture that's coming out as well too. So that's two, thing, two things I wanna pay attention to here before I move on to my next step, which will be adding my eggs. Number one is I wanna make sure that my temperature is not too hot. I just cooked this on a stove that was wicked hot. All right, that's for you, uh, all of you in uh, Massachusetts area, it's wicked hot. And uh, if I add my eggs in right now, my temperature is still going up. Right, the carryover cooking is still happening, so the temperature is still going up. If I add my eggs in right now, my eggs are gonna to begin to coagulate. I don't want them to coagulate here, I want them to coagulate in the oven. Right, so I'm not ready for that. So I, once the temperature begins to decrease, that's when I could begin adding the eggs. Right, so I always feel the bottom of the bowl. When I feel the temperature start to subside a little bit, that's when I add the eggs in. Secondly, the steam. Right, when all that extra moisture goes out, the steam will disappear. So once the, we stop seeing a large amount of steam happening coming through here, that's the second sign we can add the eggs in. So those are the two tests I tell my students all the time. Make sure that you are properly prepared for this step so we can move on to the next one. I'm gonna turn this. this is about medium speed on my mixer here. We don't worry too much about over mixing here, but we don't wanna over aerate here, right? So I like to keep it on medium speed. This will go a lot faster if I put it on high speed. But I don't want to run the risk of over air it. If we over air it, we'll create too much air pockets, right? And that will cause our shoe to burst in the oven instead of puff up and retain its shape. All right, so we can see, hopefully you can see the camera there. All right, the steam is beginning to subside. My temperature is beginning to decrease. I can still handle it for a few more seconds with my hand. I'll have my eggs here. All right, I cracked my eggs already. Now, when I add my eggs in, I make, I'm making a small batch here, but if you're making a really large batch, how do you normally add your eggs in to most products, right? You add them in one at a time. Yes, that could work, right? But if you're making a really large batch that uses 90 eggs, right? I did that a lot when I was working at Disney World. We used, right, quite a bit of eggs. I'm not going to stand there and add one egg in at a time. So what I want to do is I want to add the eggs in in increments, 25% increments. It's a lot easier to incorporate that way, but also will not waste your time. So I have my eggs right in here. I'm going to shake them up in my container. 
just like that. So they begin to mix nice and evenly, so it's a lot easier to add 25% of my egg rather than add one. I'm sure you, when you've been baking, right, you try to add one egg in, its brother comes in at the same time too. Now we have a little situation, we have a little situation there, a little crowded. Okay, so my steam is decided, I'm ready to come in. All right, my eggs are nice and scrambled together like that. So I can add them in at 25% increments. So we're gonna add the eggs in 25% increments now. One of the things I love about baking a pastry is that you have to utilize all of your senses as well too. So I taught the students that if you use, use your sense of hearing, right? The mixer, when you add, begin to add things in, the consistency of your product changes, the sound of the mixer will change as well too. You have to pay attention to that. So that's something that you get used to over time as with experience, but that's something I can pay attention to. If I'm across the other side of the bake shop, I'm listening for my mixer, the chain sounds. Chain sounds. If it changes sounds, that means there's something happening. Either I want it to happen or I don't want it to happen. Sometimes I'm more favorable than others, but at least I'm paying attention to the sound of it so I know what's going on. So I added my first 25% increment, then I add my second. Now the interesting thing about shoe and the more challenging thing is we have a situation on the back end, the eggs. You may, and not every time you're going to add all of the eggs. There may be some times you add, uh, don't, won't, need, won't use all of them. There may be times where you use the perfect amount. There may be times you may need to add more, right? And that will rely on a few different things, right? How much you pre gelatinize your starches in the beginning. If I evaporate enough, the proper amount of moisture, I should have enough. I should have, uh, be able to add enough all of my eggs in properly. It's also going to depend on your ambient environment too. If you're in a very humid environment, right? The flour is going to absorb a lot of that moisture. It's got its own moisture as well too. If I have excess moisture in my flour, I may not need to have all of the extra the moisture from my eggs. So that may, may be another option as well too. So pay attention to it. So don't always assume with kind of shoe, I may not need to use all of my eggs. So don't add all of them in. What I always recommend, when you get 50% of the way through, I'm right up now, I'm creating an emulsion. There's two things I need to create an emulsion, constant agitation and an even temperature, right? So I have my temperature because I just warmed it, but I have my agitation from my mixer as well too. My, my emulsion is not fully formed yet. It's still in the beginning stage of the infancy stages, but I need to make sure that everything is being incorporated properly. On the side of your KitchenAid bowl, right? Where my ball is and where my paddle is mixing, there's about an eighth, with one, one eighth and one quarter of an inch gap between the side of the ball and where the mixer is mixing. If the ball and the paddle were on the same plane, right, they would just be scrapping against each other. We don't want that. So there's going to be a little bit of gap. So what's happening when we mix anything is the paddle is going to be pushing your product up against the side of the bowl. And some of the product that's on the inside that's touching the paddle is going to be mixed. The product that's up against the ball is not being mixed properly. So we need to make sure everything is being mixed in properly and incorporated. We need to make sure we scrape it down. Stop scrape it. Make sure you go all the way down to the bottom. On these KitchenAid bowls, right, they have that little nub on the bottom. Make sure you get into there. Incorporate. That's where a lot of product likes to sit if it's not scraped down properly. Don't take all day. Again, we don't, we're, our emulsion is still in the formation stages. So if we let that sit for too long, we run the risk of our emulsion separating. So two seconds, turn it back on, we're good to go. After that, I set the 50% mark. I'm gonna add my 75%. Wait till it's incorporated, and then I'm gonna add the next part in. Now on the last increment, the fourth part, fourth quarter, we're gonna add that one in and also in 25% increments. I don't wanna add that all in at once, because I, again, I may not need all of this. So I'm gonna add those in the smaller increments. Perhaps you've heard my mixer is starting to sound a little differently too, right? My product is starting to come together, starting to become homogenous. It's one of my favorite words. I'm gonna get adding it in, nice and slowly. What we're looking for here to know that our shoe is done, first thing you should know is 
The first thing you should notice is it should be shiny. Want it to be shiny? The shine is coming from the egg yolks, right? If there's not enough egg yolk in there, not enough egg product in there, it's not going to be shiny. So that's sign number one. Number two, I'm going to go into next. It's a test. How the test of viscosity as well, too. And the color of it, too, should be a pale yellow, or obviously it's going to be a little yellow because we're adding the eggs in. It should be a pale yellow. That means we've incorporated enough of the egg, but also we've aerated enough as well, too, and not over aerated. So I'm going to stop my mixer here. Just scrape it down before I check. Always before you check, do an act, uh, a test on if the shoe is ready or not to check the consistency. I always recommend to scrape it down first so that you get an as accurate reading as possible. It's very possible to have uneven distribution of your egg in there. And then we have some problems on the back end, which I'll talk about when we start piping. All right, well, I really want to make sure I scrape it down really well, right? The shoe is starting to look nice and glossy and shiny. All right, so I'm going to mix it a little bit longer. Okay, so let's test and see if our shoe is ready. So I typically will do three different tests, right? Well, there are three different tests. I typically only do one of them. Either of these three tests, you can tell and determine if your shoe is ready. So the first test, I call it the V-test. Right, we're going to grab some of our dough here in our paddle and have it fall down. It should fall down and taper down to a V properly. And the viscosity of it should flow relatively evenly as well, too. Right? If we don't have that V yet, or if it flows too, too firmly, the viscosity isn't enough there yet, and we need to add more product in there. Right? So I'm not happy with that yet. So I'm going to add a little more egg. But we notice that it is still shiny. So that's a good sign. Means we're doing something right, right? So that is a good way. Shaking up the eggs is a good way to incorporate the eggs. In the event you need a little bit more than uh, the egg sector or if you've scaled out, perhaps you need a little bit more egg, right? It's very possible you may not need a full egg. You may need half of an egg or a quarter of an egg, right? That's, that's how you can measure that out that way. Check it out. Okay. Let's do another test here. So we see our viscosity is Flowing down, right? It's tapering down, downwards. And we have our V there. It should flow down like that, nice and glossy. She looking good, huh? She looking good? Yeah, I'm happy with that. Okay, test number two. Okay, it's gonna involve your fingers here too, right? Dip my fingers in there, two of them in there, right? Grab a little bit of my dough, right? What I'm gonna do is just grab just that small amount. Right, I'm going to separate my fingers just like that. Right? If I can separate my fingers about two inches and it's still connected in the very center, that means it's ready as well, too. Right? So I'm pushing two inches here. It's still connected. That's good. That means there's enough moisture in there. If there was too much, if there was too much moisture, uh, it would just collapse. Right? If there's not enough moisture, it, wouldn't, it would just separate right away. Right? So that's number two. That's number three. Getting hands, we're getting our hands, we're playing with our food today, okay? Dip your finger in there, right? You should be able to create a little curly cue. I call it the Dairy Queen curly cue, right? Just on top. Right? It curls down nice and evenly like that, and we are ready. I'm happy, they're happy, we're all happy. Let's move on to the next step. Okay? My hands off here. We are done with this mixer. So next, uh, I'm going to scrape my paddle down. Okay. 
Okay. Should be nice and glossy. By the time you are done with your shoe, you still should still have some warmth to the dip. Right? Your ball should still be, still feel very warm. And uh, in terms of temperature wise, you want to take the temperature probably between 103, 105. You don't need necessarily to take the temperature of it, but it should feel warm to your hand. That's how you know you're good to go. If your shoe is uh, cold or cooled, uh, if it starts to be, get too cool, right, then we've got to begin to aerate more, and we don't want to aerate too much here. Now, notice here, I have a little bit of my egg left over, right? So I didn't have to use all my egg. I'm still, I'm happy with this, my consistency. If I added all this in there, this would be soup. So we don't want to, you want to make sure that you pay attention to the proper consistency. And of course, you could always save this for the next batch or use this for something else that uses eggs. You don't have to, have to throw it out, right? We don't throw things out. So I'm going to scrape this down here. Put this into my piping bag. I have a piping bag here we'll fitted with a 806 piping tip. 806. Fill up my bag here. And again, you are the boss, you are in control here. You do not necessarily have to put this entire thing in the bag, right? It's always very silly when I see my students with a bag this size trying to pipe like that. Put a smaller amount in there, right? It's always, you can always go back and add more in. Right? Make it easier on yourself. So. so, since it's Valentine's Day, we're going to make some heart shapes two buns today. So I found, uh, I have this, the most adorable heart-shaped cookie cutter ever, right? Isn't that adorable, right? Cutest thing ever. Uh, very hard to find around these times, so make sure you, you buy these during the off season, okay? All right, so I have my bag all set up here, I'm ready to go, let me get rid of this pan. I use this uh, cutter here to create a template on my parchment paper. All right, so I just trace it with my Sharpie marker, trace it with my Sharpie marker, uh, and then I'm going to place this backwards, upside down. Like that. All right, so I'm sure, making sure the Sharpie part is downwards. So now I have my template. Uh, I have in the past used other templates that use uh, this. You, uh, perhaps you may have seen you dip, dip it in flour, right, and then put it on there. That's that's a great way to do that too. The only problem I have with that is uh, if you dip it in flour and then you tap the sheet tray, then it gets a little distorted. Or this is not going to go anywhere. Just make sure you put the uh, sharpie side downward, and you're good to go. All right. So next, I'm going to begin typing here. The uh, tip of the bag off. Like that. Yeah. So when piping this, we want a nice even pressure. I tell my students all the time with any type of piping, right, it is best to, if you count, right, when you count when you pipe, that way, as long as you apply the same consistent pressure, the size of it is going to be exactly the same. All right, so I'm not gonna uh, pipe, start piping here. One, two, three, come down. One, two, three, come down. One, two, three, one, two, three. One, two, three, one, two, three. Good, nice and even. I'm not gonna go all the way to the edge of my template. This is the same size as my cracklin is going to be on top. I want the cracklin to be a little bit larger than my shoe. So it can completely cover the shoe when it bakes. Flip it around like that. Now, as long as you are piping this and you release the pressure, you just have to snap your wrist a little bit and it will cut it off so you don't have uh, lift ups at the very end. Just like that. You like? You like? Nice, right? Okay. So we're going to let these uh, sit underneath my station for a little bit just to dry. And in the meantime, I'm going to begin making my crackling dough. 
okay, right here. So a crack window, the crack window is good. Uh, it's easy, really, really easy to remember how to make the crack window. Crack window is equal parts, butter, brown sugar, and all-purpose flour. Then you can obviously add some color to it as well, uh, but that's equal parts. So I'm going to do a small, small batch here, 150 grams each, 150 grams of butter and brown sugar, right, creamy method, blend it together. Room temperature. My uh, favorite tool in the pastry kitchen, the blowtorch. Help me out. So in making the crackling dough, we're relying more on consistency and evenness rather than the aeration. Even though we're utilizing the creamy method, the creamy method utilizes to rely on the aeration. You want to rely more on just making it homogenous too. All right. It's already looking good. Okay, scrape it down nice and evenly. Going. Like that. This doesn't take very long to make. Well, you can all you can make this in advance, right? And freeze it. You can put it into sheets of parchment, freeze it, and it'll last. I have my flour in now. Scrape it down one last time before I put flour in. I'm not necessarily worried about the gluten uh, development here. I want to rely on making sure it's nice and homogenous. It shouldn't take too long to come together. We just want to make it a nice dough. And then I have uh, that's about 12 grams of red food coloring. I ideally don't like using uh, food coloring, but for an option and object like this for the Franklin, I do recommend using it. You can use uh, fruit powders, vegetable powders. Those do get a little expensive, but they're, they also impart some flavor as well too. But uh, you will get a nicer, more even color if you use the uh, food coloring. And I do recommend the uh, gel gel coloring. If you use the water-based coloring, just be careful with it. We have fat in here. Fat and water don't necessarily work well together. Use a fat-based color. Right, we're going to add all of our color in. This is uh, super red. Right, so it's going to be super red real soon. That's then watch the color transform. Okay. We're just going to scrape it down here. This mixer is very happy today. <laughs> Strip it down and get rid of any of the product that was mashed up against the side. Now, you can, uh, if you like the tie dye effects here, right? If you look inside here, right? It looks a little tie dye ish, right? That's kind of a cool technique as well. That perfectly works perfectly fine. I prefer for this particular aspect, I prefer it to be all the same color, right? But if you're making a tie dye version, perhaps that will work. Very well as well too. You can combine, it's all the same product. So I can create a blue one, a red one, a yellow one, combine them together, create a tie-dye or create strips, right? Probably fine to do that. It works exactly the same. Okay, 
Okay, jump. So what we're going to do here is line this in between parchment paper. And I do recommend if you make a large batch, it's perfectly fine. Make a large batch. That's what I normally do. I'll make a large batch and just make multiple sheets. Uh, you can, I recommend putting, uh, scaling out about 450 grams, between 450 and 500 grams per half sheet. Uh, and I always recommend doing it in a half sheet. If you do a full size sheet, it's just hard to roll out. Just a lot on your hands and your wrist. All right, so this is, this is exactly 450. Scoop the whole thing. Like that. Between. have some product that's slightly undermixed, right? You can mix it together by hand, perfectly fine. Just on top like that. This is something you need to do ahead of time. I always recommend doing this uh, the day before, or at least a few hours, give some time to freeze and solidify. This is not something you can work with if it's soft. It has to be firm. So I do recommend uh, chilling at least overnight. That way you have uh, an easy job the next day. All right, we're gonna line this over top. Set out with your hands first, then with your rolling pin, dowel, where we're going to roll it in between the parchments, nice and evenly. You want this to be as thin as possible, and if you need a specific measurement, about two millimeters, two millimeters thick. If the cracklin is too thick, right, it'll begin to weigh down the shoe when it's baking in the oven, and we won't have as much puff. If it's too thin, it'll just break. You want to rely on this to be as thin as possible and even. So if you make it to the same size as your parchment, that's good enough, right? So I always recommend it's easier to come right off like that and to keep it as square as possible, right? You cut off, cut off the pieces on the ends, right? Scrape it off, put that on the end there. Put that on the end here, right? It's like Play-Doh, it's like dough, it's like working with any dough. If you work with angles, right? The angles will work with you. So refit it like that, and then transition again, just like that. Okay. So I am going to have Chef Lisa, my assistant, finish this off for me. So we can move on with our demo. Thank you, Chef. I have a crackling dough already made here. A sheet, perfectly tempered. Just like that. So, make it to the same size as your sheet, and then we're going to grab our shoe here. Here. And then we're going to take our cutter, just like that, and cut out our rounds, our parts of our dough on top. This uh, was in the freezer, and I transferred it to the fridge about 15 minutes ago to let it thaw out. I found that because this is so, uh, the two millimeters thick, if you cut it right from frozen, they begin to shatter, All right? So you have to let it temper out a little bit, but don't leave it in the fridge for too long because then they'll just get too soft. So work with, I always like recommend using a few different doughs. If one gets soft, put that one back in the freezer, grab the other one. So that way uh, you're not working with improper products, okay? Three, six, nine, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. Nice and even. Now, as I said before, I want the cracklin to be a little bit larger than my shoe, so that I will sit directly on the top, so that it will completely encapsulate our shoe. So we're going to put this right on top, just like that. Start here. It's coming together, I can tell. It's nice, right? Very nice. Nice and evenly. And we can see the thickness here, thickness of our shoe, our cracklin, should be about that thickness, okay? 
two millimeters right on top, just like that. Okay. And you want to work relatively fast here because as we are speaking, this is beginning to soften up. We want it to completely cover. If the shoe and the cracklin are the same size, I found when they bake because they're going to puff up, the cracklin will just sit halfway down and you'll see a tan line on the outside. Whereas if you have the cracklin a little bit larger, it'll completely cover the entire thing. Both are going to be just fine. They're going to taste exactly the same. It's just a matter of appearance. If you want that appearance to be completely over top or just halfway down, that's perfectly fine too. If you want to do a smaller one, that works as well. Just like that. And these can be made ahead of time. So I can make the shoe ahead of time if I want. And I can put the hats on top, the crack one on top, and I can put this whole tray in the freezer and bake it off another time. Perfectly fine. I found that they can last in the freezer for about two weeks, just like that, and bake just fine. And you can throw them right from the freezer directly into the oven, and they'll be just fine. Just make sure they are wrapped properly in the freezer, otherwise you'll get uh, the excess moisture from the ice crystals being formed. You don't want that. Keep on going. My dough is, perhaps you can see my hands, the dough is starting to soften up a little bit. That's why I do them in small batches. And we'll do the last one here. Just like that. Boom. So this obviously can be saved. This part of the, the extra crackling can be saved. Other things back in the freezer. Chef, yeah. these are going to go into the deck oven. I uh, recommend the deck oven because we have more bottom heat that way. Deck oven 375 for about 35 to 40 minutes. No need to rotate. Um, I haven't had the problem with rotating, but again, your ovens may be different, right? Everyone's oven is going to be slightly different. So if you feel the need to rotate, that's you're the boss. You take charge of that. Uh, but it should be nice and golden brown when they're done. You put these in the oven for me. And then, I made some earlier, they should come out looking like this. Isn't that awesome? They came out really nicely. So we can see the volume we created, right? We see the, the shoe on the outside, right? I will put a glove on too. Let's see what it looks like on the, on the outside and the rigid of the edges and the bottom as well. We'll do this one. Okay. So it completely covers the entire shoe all the way around. And even on the bottom too, it goes over the bottom a little bit too. We have the nice mire grounding on the bottom as well. It's nice and hollow on the inside. So it means there's, there's an air pocket inside, which is what we want, right? And we had that coveted heart shape on the, on the back and on the front, right? Isn't that awesome? It came out nice. Awesome. So, uh, Chef, can I have the uh, mixture cream, please? We have a, uh, you can fill these with anything, right? Cream, pastry cream, Bavarian cream, any type of product. Uh, you want to be careful with the product that you're using on the inside. Just be careful of the moisture content of it. Uh, be sh because we want the shoe to be nice and crisp, uh, the moisture content will cause the product, the shoe, to become soggy. We obviously don't want that. So, you should fill it as close to service as possible. I would not. Re I would recommend eating the same day, but something that looks like this it isn't probably going to last very long. So you don't have to worry about the shelf life. All right, so let's poke a little hole inside. Right, this is a vanilla bean pastry cream. Make sure you fill her up. Right, give the people what they want. Fill her up just like that. Okay. There you have it. Vanilla bean cream filled shoe bug for Valentine's Day. Cool, right? All right. Well, Chef, that looks amazing. Um, thank you so much. And I know that you've made it 
look uh, simple, but I know there's a lot of practice that that is involved for sure. Yes. Uh, we do have a couple of questions that have come in. If you might be so kind as to maybe answer a couple, we won't get to all of them. Um, but one of the viewers was wondering, is it a certain type of butter that you're using with a, a certain amount of fat content? And do you use salted or unsalted butter? That's a great question. So we use unsalted, unsalted butter. Um, and the butter that I did use was uh, Grand Reserve butter. It's 83%, 83% butter fat. Um, the fat content of the butter isn't really going to affect it. The, the final product of the shoe, we just want it to be uh, a good, I mean, the better is the butter, obviously the better the flavor, the better reaction going to get. But if you use an 80% fat butter, that's perfectly fine. Right? I, I haven't had any problems with any, any of the lower percentage butters as well. Great question. Fabulous. Well, thank you. Um, another viewer is wondering if you add the eggs cold or room temperature. Great question. Really great question. So again, we've been talking about the uh, emulsion, creating the emulsion. We need the constant agitation and even temperature. So because we had uh, our, our dough on the stove and still warm, right, it would kind of make not, not very much sense if I had cold eggs. A cold egg would suck all the temperature out of my, my dough, causing me to lose the temperature. And then at, at the very end, I would begin aerating instead of mixing. Right, so I did uh, pull the eggs so about room temperature. They don't have to be uh, warm. Like you can, I had my students put uh, the eggs in warm water right, just to bring them up to room temperature. They don't have to be warm, but just not cold. So room temperature is perfectly fine. All right, wonderful. Um, another viewer was wondering if you need to dry the pad shoe a bit before adding the topping, or um, could you do that right in a row if you had everything ready? With the cracked lid, you don't have to dry it. If you're just making a platter's cream puffs, whatever, if there's nothing going on top, I do recommend drying to create that crust on the outside, the, the, the air dried crust on the outside so they don't crack, right? But since you have a, the, you're putting something else on top, you can pipe them, put the hat on top and then bake it right away. There's no, there's no resting period needed. Uh, but if you needed to put a resting period, they will be fine if you do let them rest. Great question. Great, well, thank you. Someone is wondering if they've added an, too many eggs by accident. Is there any way to fix the dough or is there any other use that they might be able to use that? Excellent question, really excellent question. So most of the formulas that we have, right, they have an equal amount of strengtheners or stabilizers and liquefiers, right? There's a calibrated uh, equilibrium of them. If there's one more than the other, if we have too much strengtheners, too much uh, uh, stabilizers, right? Our dough, our product is gonna get too tough. If there's too much liquefier, our product isn't gonna rise or just too liquidy. Right, and that goes for most of our baked good products. Now, specifically with the shoe, because we're working with the ratio, we're working with moisture content as well too. If we add too much egg, that means we have too much moisture. So that means our liquefier is higher than our stabilizer. So the way to fix that without throwing it out, right? That's, that's the last option we wanna do. You don't wanna have to throw it out. There's a way to fix it. So what you can do is create another dough, right? Do a half batch of the dough, right? Your liquids, your liquids, your fat, and your flour, cook another half batch. Right? Put that into another bowl and then add the already liquefied, the over, overly uh, liquefied batter. Add that to that new batter until the consistency is right. You have a little bit more extra dough, right? That's a little bit extra, but it saves you from having to throw it out. Now, the worst thing that you want to do is you add too much, and then it's liquefied again, and now you're just wasting your time. But that will be the way to do it. Create another half batch of dough. Right, add the old, add the new, the old one to the new one until it's the proper consistency, and then you're good to go. Oh, great insights! And then we do have some students that are tuning in. They're wondering how you chose between culinary and baking and pastry. If we have some people who are kind of on the fence when it comes to their next step in their education. You know, believe it or not, I actually started out in culinary. Uh, I can throw it out in the kitchen. So if Bobby Flay wants to challenge me, I'll challenge him. Uh, but I, there, I chose baking over. Culinary, uh, I just found, I found pastry a little bit more challenging to me. Um, and I didn't like being defeated by baked goods. You know, it's like, you know, this is a cake. I used to cry all the time and I would cut my cakes because my chef would put me on there purposely uh, because she knew I couldn't do it, but she wanted me to get better. But my cake layers were just like topsy-turvy and it would just mortify me every single time. But I was like, you know what? I don't want to be defeated by this. This seems really cool and there's something I can dive down into as well. And also, for the people that know me, I'm a really big nerd, right? It takes a, a really big nerd to be really good at baking, right? So I understand a lot of the baking science part of it and, uh, you know, starches, proteins, you know, sugars, right? Sugar caramelization, right? Bread, bread fermentation, all those yeast fermentation, all those things. 
right? So I really was fascinated by that. So that that's kind of the route that went, I drove down, and uh, I'm glad that I never went back. But uh, I do enjoy cooking very much. I cook when I'm at home, uh, and I like to experiment a lot too. But baking is something that's always been uh, very, very uh, near and dear to my heart, and something I enjoy very much. Wonderful. Well, thank you. And I'm sure that helps some of the students who are tuning in. And um, another chef is wondering if you had any uh, advice for any specials or Valentine's Day menus when it comes to the dessert menu. Anything that you see trending right now or that's a favorite dessert of yours that they could uh, investigate? Uh, great question. Uh, souffle is a very popular thing. Uh, the molten lava cake, always a classic. Uh, many restaurant menus I've done have usually done a chocolate souffle, chocolate souffle for two, so a really big souffle, and then they would pour the, uh, the crema glaze inside the uh, table side, which is, people love table side service, so it's best for dessert. Uh, what else? The, uh, the chocolate dome, right? You pour the hot chocolate over top. That just, that's been trending for the last five, six years, right? And continuing to go on. And another thing that I found, uh, well, too, you know, going back to my friend who owns uh, Chocolate Boutique is the, uh, the chocolate boxes where you break it with the mallets, right? People love, people love interact. People love breaking things, right? People love using cameras, right? But if you put those two together, cameras and chocolate, everyone's having a good, good time. <laughs> Sounds great. Um, just a, a couple more quick ones. If you might just kind of run us through, um, what's a day in the life of a student who's in your class? Um, what, is that, what does that look like? What time do you arrive to class? Um, and if you could give us any, any examples or insight. Day in the life of one of my students. Uh, it's very, very, uh, like I said, I'm a very big nerd, so I do provide a lot of information. So I expect them to retain that information, right? I do, do give a lot of hints, right? Perhaps it may be on your quiz. I say hint, 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 hint all the time. That means I want you to write it down and take a lot of notes, right? My <laughs> demos are very interactive as well, too. During my demos, I don't, I don't, I try not to just talk at the students, right? And your education should be a conversation. I need to know that you are paying attention as well, right? And in, in the conversation, so it's between the two of us and, you know, everyone else in the class. So I want to make sure that you are understanding everything that I'm saying. So when I'm doing my demos, I actually ask the students to tell me what to do. And then I do it so that, so I know that they've been paying attention. They've read the formula. I know how to make all this stuff. I don't need to show them. Right? I, I have to show them so they know how to do it. Right? They're not as experienced as I am, right? but I want to make sure that they've pay, been paying attention during my lectures, paying attention to the videos that are online, and paying attention to the formulas, the step by step on the formula. So I tell them exactly, what am I doing next? What's my next step? Do I fold this? Do I add this all at the same time? What temp do I bake this at? What happens if my oven's at the wrong temperature? What do I do? Do I have to wait? Can I put it in? Right? I, I have them interact, interact with uh, my demo. So number one, they're not falling asleep. But secondly, I know that they're paying attention and they understand these things. I can't teach you how to, I'm not, we're not teaching, my object as an instructor is not to teach you how to be a robot because robots only do one thing. That's it, right? If something goes wrong, the robot malfunctions. So I want to show them as well, like if something goes wrong, if something's not right, can, how do you react? Your reaction is what makes you a great relationship, not a robot. Oh my goodness, I'd love to spend a day in your class. Um, any, any final words that you have for the um, students or professionals or educators who are tuning in today? Uh, final words, just you know, reach for the stars. Just take everything, you know, everyone that is there to support you. This industry is very rough, but as long as you have people that are there to mentor you, you have organizations like the ACF, another organization that I'm part of, there to mentor you and guide you in your career, right? You can have a very, very long lasting career in this, in this industry. And you, just because you go into this career, doesn't necessarily mean you have to be a chef, baker, pastry chef, right? You can do so many different things related to food that have nothing to be, you don't have to be in the kitchen all the time. So don't feel like if you're, you're forced to be in the kitchen all the time, it doesn't have to be, you know, 16, 18 hour, 20 hour days all the time for you. you can still be involved with food, but not in the kitchen all the, in the aspect. Uh, I also would like to thank the ACF, Jackie, and everyone at the ACF organization for uh, having me do this demo for all of you. Thank you to Culinary Institute of America for providing this uh, platform for me as well. And uh, I'd like to thank my trusty assistant, Jeff Lisa Kirstner, for having my back and uh, being here to support me on all these demos that I do. And uh, couldn't have done it without you. So thank you all. And thank you for tuning in. And uh, if you would like to follow me on Instagram, I'm sorry, a shameless plug, right? Instagram, Ganache0607. G-A-N-A-C-H-E 0607, right? I post a lot of stuff from my, my class as well uh, to give you a little bit more educational aspect of what we do uh, in, in my class specifically.
Well, thank you so much, Chef. And everyone definitely should go and, and follow Chef. He has a great Instagram account and a huge virtual round of applause as we thank the fabulous Chef Jesse Jackson from the CIA. Um, I know you all learned a lot today. And Chef, we're very grateful for you sharing your passion and appreciate you taking the time to share your skills and enthusiasm for the pastry craft with the students and professionals tuning in today. So I hope everyone who is tuning in is now thinking about how they can step up their pastry game this year. And if you're interested in becoming a student at the CI, please go to cichef.edu for more information or to apply. For everyone tuning in, please be on the lookout for the survey that you'll receive along with the recording. You'll need to complete the survey in order to earn one hour of CEH. And we hope that you'll join us for an upcoming webinar, perhaps on March 8th, when we celebrate International Women's Day with a spotlight on women chefs, or on March 10th, when we'll travel virtually to West Virginia to learn more about gluten-free baking techniques from a rising culinary star at the Greenbrier Resort. Or maybe even on March 13th for a discussion on culinary entrepreneurship with young chefs. And hot off the press, um, we'll also be adding a social media for food business webinar in collaboration with the Retail Bakers of America on February 23rd. So we have a whole great lineup of webinars planned. Please check out the schedule and register today on wearechefs.com. And don't forget, we're heading to the Big Easy. You're all invited. Please save the date or register today for our ACF National Convention in New Orleans to be held July 16th through the 19th and our Educator Summit, which will be held on the 16th. So on behalf of the ACF National Office, thank you again to New Hampshire and Massachusetts ProStart. Thank you to our amazing guest, Chef Jesse Jackson from the Culinary Institute of America for bringing us this delicious learning opportunity. And thank you all for tuning in today. Happy Valentine's Day, everyone, and we'll see you soon. I'm Dara Yu, I'm a baking and pastry major at the Culinary Institute of America, and I have 60 seconds to tell you about it. So why did I choose this major? I wanted to build a strong foundation of skills and learn from chefs who have a wide range of expertise and experience. My favorite class has been confectionery arts where we make chocolate and sugar sculptures and work with fondant and gum paste. The way that I like to explain it is like, it's like an edible art class. Something that surprised me about this major is how many different career paths you can take with the skills and knowledge that you learn. And some, one of the most important things I've learned so far is how important machinery and tools are keeping an open mind in and out of the kitchen and making sure to make as many connections as possible. Uh, and where do I see this taking me in the future? Definitely I want to operate my own bakery, but I'm also interested in event planning, uh, food media, and recipe development. I'm Daru and this has been Baking and Pastry Arts at the CIA in 60 Seconds.